Good morning. Welcome to peace. Welcome to your Lord's house today. It's great to be in God's house. It's a beautiful day. Um, not only because of the sunshine, but because we get to be warned by the, the love of God and his word. Uh, today, as we continue through the Advent season, we come to the third Sunday in the season of Advent, and things change a little bit, in, especially as we kind of follow the, the Advent uh, wreath. So we've lit, we have lit uh, two blue candles, and today is the, the pink candle. And it's always a, a question of, okay, why, why one pink in the middle of all of this? And try to make a long story short, as you're preparing for the Lord, as you're preparing for Jesus, uh, oftentimes the message is repent, right? John the Baptist, repent, the kingdom of God is near. And so uh, historically, it, it, the color was purple, the color of repentance. And so it's this time of, of looking inside and seeing who we are and confessing that to God. But on the third Sunday, we once again just look toward God and rejoice to see who he is, that he is a, a loving God, a forgiving God. And so today is all about uh, re rejoicing. So that's the reason for the pink calendar, and that's really the theme for our service today. Uh, come, Emmanuel, come to bring rejoicing. We're going to take a look at a, a different kind of rejoicing of how in the middle of situations where you'd least expect joy, that's where God meets us and that's where he brings rejoicing. So we'll see that in our readings, our songs, and then in the message today. Everything we need for our service is in the service folder. You can follow along there. It's also up on the screen. You can follow along if that's how you're m more comfortable. Uh, a quick note about the Advent gathering rite. For, for those who have been here a little bit this Advent season, we've been using this gathering rite, and so our song leaders will will lead us in that, but I just wanted to point out a difference this week. You're going to sing some Latin, okay? Um, we've been singing, Lord, have mercy on us, and um, I'm going to use the Latin words for that, Kyrie eleison. So there's three times, Kyrie eleison, and then Christe eleison, so Christ have mercy, and then Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy again. Why? Well, yes, I'm a little weird. Just because. But also, do you remember what I said? This, this, uh, this hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, it's a prayer that dates back from at least the 400s A.D. And so, as we sing it in Latin, we kind of hearken back to history and, and join our voices with literally thousands, probably millions of Christians over the centuries who have prayed this prayer. So that, that's the reason we do that. That said, God bless our worship. Let's begin with our Ad Advent gathering rite. Please stand. Trusting in God's mercy, which knows no end, let us confess our sins. Almighty and merciful Lord, I come before you with a heavy heart. I confess that I have strayed from your righteous path, wandering into the shadows of my own desires. I confess the arrogance of my heart that blinds me to your wisdom thinking myself wiser than your eternal counsel. I confess the times I turned away, seeking solace in worldly pleasures, allowing the transient to overshadow the eternal. Lord, I am burdened by the weight of my sins, but I find hope in your promise of redemption. I seek refuge in your mercy, 
O oh, gracious God. Fear not, for the Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One saves. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by His death on the cross and freed us from death by His resurrection from the grave. He rejoices over you with gladness. He quiets you with His love. He exalts over you with loud singing. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Amen.
Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We now focus our hearts, our minds on the lessons from God's Word. Our first lesson is taken from Zephaniah chapter 3. This will be our sermon text, and so we will uh, meditate on this further at that time. But maybe just as you, as you hear this for the first time, just some expl- explanation. Again, this is a prophet of God in the Old Testament who's coming to God's people and, and warning them, first of all, before this, that Turning away from God has consequences. It it brings disaster in your life. And very specifically for God's Old Testament people, it meant that their their nation would be destroyed. They'd be carried off into captivity. Just utter darkness. But God never leaves his people there. He loves them too much. And so when we come to Zephaniah chapter 3, we have these beautiful promises. And at first you would think that the best thing that they could hear was that this... this, uh, this captivity wouldn't happen, or at least they would come back and be a great nation again. That's too little for God. God has something way bigger in mind. He has all people in mind. He wants to gather all people and make all people rejoice with a deliverance, not only from captivity to a different nation, but the captivities we struggle with every day, captivity to sin, captivity to fear of death, captivity to temptation, God is the one who delivers us from all of that, and this is a promise of that. So when you hear words like daughter Zion or Israel or Jerusalem, get the the modern news things out of your mind. These are beautiful pictures of God talking about his, his church, all of his believers. And so these words are spoken to you so that you can rejoice. With that context, hear the words of Zephaniah 3. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children, I invite you to come forward for the children's message. Good morning. It's great to have you in God's house. Thanks for coming up here today. Remember, I've been asking you a little bit. Do you have your houses all decorated for Christmas yet? Yeah? Okay, good. And, and our church is all decorated for Christmas. As you look around at the decorations for Christmas here, what, what can you tell? How do we like to decorate? What are the things that you notice the most? What, is, what are all around us? What do you notice? You know what I notice? See if you notice this too. I notice a lot of lights. You see all the lights? On the side, in the back, in the, in the Christmas tree, even, even candles. We light candles. We like light at Christmas time, don't we? I wonder why that is. Would... Would it be as great if you came into church today and you just had the tree and there were no lights? Is that as pretty? No, do you want me to turn the lights back on? Okay, let's do that. Yeah. We like lights. Why do we like lights at Christmas time? It's because they remind us of something. These lights are pretty. The candles are pretty, but there's a greater light, a more beautiful light. 
and we're going to hear about that in the next reading that I'm going to say, but I'm going I'm to read it to you first. It says that, um, that a man came before Jesus. His name was John. Sometimes we know him as John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. And he said he came to tell about the light. He wasn't the light, but he wanted to tell everybody about the light. Who do you think is the greatest light that he was talking about that we celebrate? Do you have any ideas? Yeah. It's Jesus. So that's a strange name to call somebody, right? A light, but that's a, a name for Jesus, a light. And why is he a light? It's because sometimes the, like, we, we talk about this, right? The, the naughty things we do, the bad things we do, the, the good things that we don't do, those are sins, right? But th- do they make us feel bad? And it kind of feels dark in our lives, right? Well, what does Jesus do to the darkness of our sins? Just like turning the lights on makes the darkness go away, Jesus in our lives makes the sin go away. And so when you look at the lights this Christmas, the lights at your house, or if you see lights in the, in the city as you drive by, or the big, the big star on the hill in Boulder, or the Christmas lights here, or the candles, I want you to think about the greatest light who gives you the light of his love. And that light is, tell me again, Jesus. Yeah. Should we pray to Jesus? Dear Jesus, There is sometimes darkness in our lives because of sadness, because of our sins, but we thank you for being the light, for taking all of our sins away and giving us the light of your love. Help us to always look at these lights and be reminded of you and your love. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up here. I have a children's bulletin for you. Here you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. What's that? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There you go. Yes. As we turn our attention now to the gospel lesson, uh, the gospel records the words and the works of our Savior Jesus, and so we stand in respect for those words. The Gospel according to John chapter 1. Imagine the rejoicing that would have happened for people who connected the dots, who had been hearing these promises like we heard in Zephaniah about the Lord being the deliverer. And then all of a sudden, after thousands of years, hundreds of years of waiting and all these promises being told, here comes John the Baptist saying, the light is here. What cause for rejoicing? There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize you with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our next song.
grace and mercy and peace, those are your blessings. They come to you from God himself through our Savior Jesus. Amen. So the word, we, uh, word of God we want to focus on a little further this morning is that first lesson we heard from the prophet Zephaniah. I'll be reading those words in the middle of the sermon. At Christmas time, we, we see a lot of different characters put in front of us in, in books, in movies. And I'll admit that there's, there's always been this one character that's always captured my attention at Christmas time. And it's never any fun to just tell you something. I want you to guess who it is. Okay, I've got a description of this character. Uh, and here it is. Uh, the cold within him froze his old features, nipped his... I can't read it on there because of the glare. <laughs> uh, nipped his pointed nose, shriveled his cheek, stiffened his gait, made his eyes red, his thin lips blue, and spoke out shrewdly in his greeting voice. No warmth could warm, no wintry weather could chill him, no wind that blew was bitterer than he. The heaviest rain and snow and hail and sleet could boast of the advantage over him in one respect. They often came down handsomely, and he never did. So basically, you have two, two choices, right? In my, at least to my knowledge, there are two characters at Christmas whose names have become synonymous with mean nastiness and grouchiness that nobody wants to be a part of. And I'll give you a hint, this is not the Grinch. So who is it? It's Scrooge, yes, that's right. Uh, Charles Dickens, Christmas Carol. This is a description of Ebenezer Scrooge in, in the beginning of the, the story. And just a bonus question, just, just because... Of all the movie versions of The Christmas Carol, which one's the best? If you don't say The Muppets, you're wrong. <laughs> That's my favorite for some reason. They're all pretty good, but anyway, that was just a bonus thing. I guess Scrooge always has intrigued me a little bit. I think because of the literal overnight transformation. Right, you... You read this description, and then as you read through the story, every word you read or, or every scene that you see in the movie, it just backs that description up. And then you start to add your own not-so-nice descriptives for this man. And then all of a sudden, you get to the end. He's nice. He's happy. He's giving. He's generous. He's basically dancing and singing over the very people who irritated him so much at the beginning. It's... I think that's what captures me. It's, it's like the least expected ending that you would ever have. How does that happen? How can it happen that a story that starts out with bitterness and anger ends in rejoicing? And that comes to why I'm talking about Scrooge at all. That's the question I want you to keep in mind as we now turn our focus to the Old Testament prophecy in Zephaniah. How can a story that begins with so much bitterness and anger end in rejoicing? Because that's the story of Zephaniah. It's three chapters. If you open up your Bibles and read Zephaniah, you're not going to like it. I'm just, just being honest. In, in Zephaniah, the first two-thirds record, in my opinion, one of the most awesome, or maybe you'd want to use the word awful, description of God's wrath and judgment over sin in all of Scripture. That's the first two chapters. God's people had turned their backs on God who had been faithful to them, and God was warning them that he was angry and that there was going to be punishment because of that. They had brought it upon themselves. They had earned every bit of punishment in chapters 1 and 2, that's all it is. And as you read it, you just become aware of something that isn't so fun. That God is angry at sin. So no, you don't like to read it. I, I just kind of, I'm going to do a little bit of an aside here and, and talk about that for a second. You, you read things like that. Zephaniah chapter 1 and two, and that's really what turns people off about God, isn't it? I think you read something like that, and that's where you get descriptions that I, of God that I came across. This is from, he, he's a famous atheist, or was a famous atheist, uh, uh, Richard Dawkins. 
And this is how he described God. And it's almost worse than Scrooge, right? The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of literature. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, petty, unjust, unforgiving, control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a capriciously malevolent bully. I think he must have been reading Zephaniah 1 and 2. Or something like it. Now these are harsh words, harsh description of God. And, and you and I sitting here today, we, we would never describe like God like that. But can we admit? We get it. Right? We, we read words like this and, and we definitely get it. Because we struggle with a God who is angry at sin. Don't we? We struggle with a God who would fill two-thirds of a book warning people about the judgments that are coming because they're evil. What do we do with things like this when we come across them in the Bible? Where's the God of love and mercy that we want to hear about? I think this is important enough because it helps us to approach knowing God. It helps us to understand Him. It helps us to approach his word. What do we do with these things? I want to help us to understand that God's wrath over sin, when we have these awesome descriptions of God's wrath, it's not petty. It's not God having a short fuse and exploding. It's actually an aspect of who he is and who he has to be. And here's how I want you to understand this. Okay? Just, just put yourself in this position. What would you do if someone that you dearly love, I'm not talking about an acquaintance, I'm not talking about someone you know or even a stranger, that someone who is close to you your whole life, someone you dearly love, all of a sudden, they start to make some really unwise decisions in their life. And it goes on, and more than that, they start doing things that are really destroying their lives. Destroying the lives of people around them. They start separating from you and hanging around people that are harmful to them and then breaking away from those relations that are helpful and and healthy to them. How, How would you feel? Just shrug your shoulders? Well, they're dear to me and I love them, but whatever, I need to be tolerant. You're just indifferent to it all? No. I guarantee you that's not how you feel. You feel hurt, right? And that hurt can turn into anger, not necessarily at them, but for them. So if that's how flawed, sinful people like me and you can feel about people we love, how much more is that going to be with a perfect God who made people to be his own, people he loves dearly. And so can you see? God's wrath is not petty. It's not this cranky explosion. God's wrath is an essential aspect of his holiness, but more of that, God's wrath is an expression of his love for people. In this way, maybe a little different picture, but it still proves the point. It's his opposition to that cancer of sin that's eating at the inside of the people he loves. I know I spent a little time on an aside, but I think that's helpful to understand what what that is because this is the whole setting of, of Zephaniah 3. And it helps us because when we read these words, we don't just see people of old. We wonder about ourselves, right? We, we want to hear that our sin isn't so bad, That God isn't really concerned with our sin, but this shows us the reality of our sin is greater than we could have ever imagined, and God is more angry at it than we could have ever dreamed of, and God has to deal with it. So that brings us to the point of Zephaniah 3, okay? And what I want to ask you is, what do we do now? What do we do when we realize this about sin and we realize this about God? What what do we do? Rejoice. <laughs> now, you've, now you really know I've lost it, right? What are you talking about? You heard me. 
Rejoice. I know this is the last thing that you'd expect after two chapters of God's anger over sin. It's kind of like the unexpected happiness at the end of the Christmas carol, right? But here's the thing. You remember how I said the first two chapters of Zephaniah are some of the most awesome descriptions of God's wrath? It's amazing. Zephaniah 3 is, some of the most, is one of the most moving descriptions of God's love for people in all of Scripture. It really is. And guess what? That's where our text comes in. Let's get into our text. I know that's a long introduction, but... Shout, daughter Zion... Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. Man, these are really drastic, drastically different words from the first two chapters if we spend. So how do you, how do you rejoice after that? Um, maybe illustrate it like this. I read that uh, the king of the country, Jordan, um, I don't know if he's still king, but he became king in 1999, and Ever since then, he has this different way of ruling. He likes to uh, disguise himself often and just be out among people so that people don't recognize him. And he he wants to do that because he wants to listen to people. He wants to be able to serve their needs better. And so he's listening. He's he's sympathizing with people. He's visiting hospitals. he's, He's helping those in need. That, the reason we can we can rejoice is because these words are about a king like that. But even better, a way better king than that. These words in Zephaniah were written 600 years before he was born. But these words are a prophecy of what God would do for his people and what God has done for us in sending Jesus. You see, Jesus came not just to visit us, but to be one of us. And in being one of us, he is able to deal with our sin and our guilt. We see that as we, as we read on. It says in verse 15, The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. See, by sending Jesus, God shows even more about himself. In Jesus, God is just. He can be angry over sin, but he is merciful. He's he's both at the same time. Now, how does that work? Well, in Jesus, God punished my sin and your sin, but he punished who? Jesus, not you. And so what that means is all of our sin and all of our guilt is taken away. The punishment is not put upon us. It is cleared. And all of our enemies, not just sin, but but the devil who brings us temptation, uh, the world, death that brings so much fear, those things are defeated. And it's proved because Jesus didn't just die on the cross. He rose from the dead. God accepted that payment. And now we can... Do what he's commanding here. Sing. We can rejoice. We can shout aloud. Has there ever been a greater reason to shout aloud? Has there ever been a greater reason to rejoice? God has dealt with our sins. He has taken away our punishment. That's the God of love and mercy that we see. That's why he is the God of love and mercy. And that's the big shift in Zephaniah, just like in the Christmas carol. Remember the description of Scrooge that I put up there at the beginning? This is the description of Scrooge at the end. Scrooge became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew or any other good old city, town, or borough in the good old world. You know, those visits by the spirits at night, they they really changed him. Friends, Jesus coming to the earth as our Savior changes everything, including, including how we picture our God. And that's how I want to end. This is the most beautiful description of God in all the scripture, possibly. Listen to how God is described. 
Talk about different from before. It says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. It's an unbelievable difference, isn't it? Have you ever pictured God this way? I don't think we ever picture God the way the Richard Dawkins quote pictured him. But I think sometimes, even if we think of God as loving and merciful, we, we kind of picture God as kind of begrudgingly letting us into his kingdom now. All right, Jesus found some loophole in the law. He, he came up with some plea bargain for you. Absolutely not. No way. L- look at this. Because God sent Jesus as your substitute, God is rejoicing over you. He welcomes you. He, he throws a party. He has a shout that shakes the ends of creation. He sings with all of his might. He dances with joy over you. Have you ever pictured God that way? Dancing and singing because of you? For me, anyway, I picture us doing that when we get to heaven, praising and singing to God. But here it's the exact opposite. God is singing. God is dancing over you. That's how much he loves you. If you haven't pictured him like that, I would encourage you to start picturing God like that. Because you know what this all means? If you are weary... God provides rest in Jesus. If you are mourning, God provides comfort in Jesus. If you feel worthless, like you don't have any belonging, God cares for you. He gives you belonging. He gives you value in Jesus. If you're feeling weak, God gives you strength in Jesus. If you're battling from, with sin and burdened by your guilt, God provides a Savior for you in Jesus. I know all of those things I mentioned are the least likely circumstances of joy, but that's where your God meets you. In Jesus, he gives you reason for rejoicing. He's rejoicing over you so that you can rejoice in every circumstance. And that's what I want you to go home with today with that beautiful picture of God rejoicing over you because he's taken your punishment away. You are his. So that's hard to sink in, so how I want to end is, if you would please, I I want to read these words together. Will you read with me? Sing, shout aloud, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, your God, is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Yes, come, Emmanuel, and bring us rejoicing. Amen. May the peace of God that goes beyond all of our understanding guard to keep our hearts and our minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue by declaring our faith together. What a beautiful blessing that is so easily overlooked, but it's just a great blessing that we gather here together as those who share a faith together. So to declare our faith today, we're going to use the words of the Nicene Creed. I I invite you to stand. We believe in one God— the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. This time we remember our offerings and uh, what a beautiful way to rejoice. Um, God has done everything for us in Christ and has removed all of, our, all of the judgment against us and now we are free and so we freely give thanks to him. If you're a guest today, don't feel obligated to give. You're welcome to. But this is a way that we join together as a, as a church family to say thank you to God and to, be able, and to continue to be able to share the good news with each other and with our community. At this time, let's, let's uh, take an opportunity to connect a little deeper, a little more personally. In your bulletin, there's a connect card. Uh, please fill out whatever you're comfortable filling out. This is an opportunity for me to rejoice over you, uh, that, that you're here for our worshiping family today. It's an opportunity to uh, request any prayers that you might have. Uh, I, can, uh, I can have those in my prayer, personal prayers for you this week, or if you'd like to, to meet and chat about anything, you can put that in there too. During this time, as you fill those out, let's take an opportunity to uh, meditate on the word of God we have heard today. Thank you for filling out a Connect card. I appreciate those opportunities to connect with you on a more personal level. If you did fill out a Connect card, you can place those in the offering plates on the way out. At this time, let's go to our God in prayer, and I would invite any personal prayer requests that you would have at this time. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Um, my father, Matthew, um, brain cancer, um, uh, he was hospitalized on Friday and he was uh, hospitalized in the bed for um, the good night of the brain health and he was in bed for two days. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Yes. Wow. All right. Thank you. 
Okay, what a privilege to go to our God in prayer and know that he hears us. I invite you to stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all thanks and praise for what we have heard today, that even though we have turned our backs on you so often, you are a God of mercy and grace, that you have taken away our punishment by sending Jesus to be our Savior. We thank you that through his work, not only are we your children, you don't just tolerate us, you exalt over us, you rejoice over us. What? A beautiful uh, assurance to know that that's our relationship with you. In that confidence, we come to you with our prayer request today. We give you thanks uh, on behalf of Zechariah and Kelsey, especially for, for Kelsey as her, her back has begun to heal a little bit. Um, thank you for the relief that that brings and for the amazing way that you have created our bodies to be able to do that. Um, but we ask that you would continue to, to be with her and, and, uh, and grant her healing so that uh, she is able to uh, be free from, from pain and things that inhibit her in her life. Um, we thank you for that, Lord. Uh, we ask you to be with Matthew at this time as he is hospitalized. Um, be with him and help him to know that you are his loving Lord, that you care about him. Um, at this time, we ask that you would be with uh, the medical staff and give them wisdom as they care for him to be able to, to, to diagnose, find and diagnose uh, what is going on, and, and even more than that, if it is your will, to, to be able to help him in a way that, that helps his body to, to heal so that he can get back to, uh, to normal life as well. And through these things, Lord, always uh, help us to be uh, your instruments of, of love and peace in his life so that he can continue to know you more and more. Lord, we join uh, Carl and Linda in rejoicing over their daughter, Molly, who has come to an end of her schooling and has earned uh, the doctor degree. Um, thank you for all the, the hard work that she has put in and uh, for the results of that, and we ask that you would be with her and bless her in her life going forward. Uh, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for the confidence that you answer our prayers. We pray this all in Jesus' name, who has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Prepare, prepare our hearts for Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. With all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated.
Please stand for the dismissal and the blessing. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. O God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing song.
Good morning. Welcome to every one of you. It's great to be here. Um, at this time, maybe I would excuse the Sunday school students and teachers, and you can go back and get a head start on your Sunday school ling. <laughs> so yes, welcome. Um, thank you to musicians, everybody that, that works so hard to make ministry happen here at Peace. Appreciate that so much. Um, today is our Cup of Peace Latte Bar. So um, stick around for that if you'd like. In, in the back, um, in the fellowship area, you can uh, place your order. There's a lot of good, good things. The, is it Cup of Snow? Is that the? Cup. cup of Joy. Man, that's a different one. Cup of Joy sounds really good. The eggnog-based uh, sounds, sounds awesome. So, but there's, there's all, all kinds of things, hot chocolate, teas, uh, and things like that. So uh, check it out. Um, just a few announcements uh, this week. Um, so... Christmas Eve falling on a Sunday is always just a little different. So here's, here's our schedule for next week. We're going to have Sunday church like we always do in the morning. So 9 a.m., we're going to uh, c- come to a conclusion with our series, Come Emmanuel. So uh, we'll, we'll conclude that series. But then Christmas Eve night at 5 p.m., we'll have our uh, Christmas Eve celebration, our Christmas celebration. So that'll be a service of readings and songs and and message, but also then uh, one of our favorites too is ending the night uh, singing Silent Night by Candlelight. So uh, 5 p.m. Sunday, uh, it's a great service to invite friends to, uh, to share the good news of Jesus. If you want an easy way to do that, two ways I would have you do would be grab a, a postcard and just kind of hand that to them or, or send it to them. Or a real easy way too is if you're on social media, as we, we push out uh, some invitations to uh, Christmas Eve, just, just share those like them, uh, or whatever, that, that helps get the, the word out as well. So just, uh, just a cool thing to do to be able to share Jesus. Uh, what other announcements am I missing? I feel like I'm missing something. There's been so many announcements all this, this month. That's it? That's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, so cup of peace, Christmas Eve. Um, go this week, again, with that, that beautiful picture of God. God singing, God dancing. Why? Because of you, that's how much he loves you. So I hope that brings you peace and and joy so you can rejoice all week this week. Have a great week in your Lord. Oh, come, oh, come in my Some captive is that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel.
shall come to you.